professional jazz drummer and educator. I went through the jazz program at University of North Texas. Um, before that, I was at Mount Hood Community College, went through the jazz band and jazz choir at the Dave Bardoon experience, for those of you who know who Dave Bardoon is. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with some of the greatest music educators really in the world, both drummers um, and other instrumentalists. And I feel very lucky for that and I, and I carry a lot, of, um, a lot of their teachings with me. I do a lot of clinics, I judge a lot of jazz festivals. So I've spent a lot of time listening to and working with drummers of all levels. And when I'm judging a festival and adjudicating, I have to listen to what they're doing and I think, what can I tell this drummer, you know, to give them something to take with them? And if it's an absolute beginner who is really just not even close to, you know, doing anything, I think, well, what's, what's the core foundation that I can give them to start with? And then I also think, okay, here's a drummer who's really got it going on. What can I tell them then to be even more musical, to be even more professional? So with this session, I call it um, elevating your drummers to the next level. And the way I've organized this is I put it in the category of, of three levels of drummers. Um, so that all of you, if you have a drummer, if you're working with absolute beginning musicians and you're doing jazz band, if you have an experienced drummer who's like, what do I do now? I already know how to play the rhythm. Or if you have an experienced drummer who's like really getting bored and like, you know, I don't know what else to do. So this session is for you. So level one, as I said, the absolute beginner maybe has poor coordination, um, doesn't even know what jazz is. What's a bossa nova? I've never done this before. I'm, I'm scared. Level two, someone who has some coordination, you know, they can demonstrate these grooves. Um, they're ready for input. If you, if you can tell them something, they're able to do that kind of that middle, middle of the line drummer. And then the experienced drummer, the person who's been playing for a long time, the one who you're scratching your head saying, I don't know what to tell this person because they seem to be, they seem to be doing okay. So when I'm working with my drummers with swing, there's some teachers who start with, they start with the, the subdivision pattern and they do something what they call drop the stick. And that comes from, from Jeff Hamilton. And it's a really nice way to get them to relax on the right symbol, but it doesn't include a good pulse and a good drive. So I always start with quarter notes. Because think about it, who does the drummer need to line up with? The bass player. Does the place player, bass player go ding a ding, ding a ding, ding a ding? No, they're going boom, doom, doom, doom. And if a drummer is not doing that well, they're not going to do this as well, as well. So I always start with quarter notes, and I challenge my drummers, and I tell the directors, I brace them ahead of time, for at least a week, play nothing but quarter notes on the right cymbal in, in big band. Because a drummer should be able to drive the entire band with their quarter note pulse, with their quarter note pulse. So, First day of jazz band, first day a drummer ever picking up sticks, and you're calling a swing tune. You can just have them do quarter notes. Don't worry about the subdivision. Hi-hat on two and four. There are times when that's all I play on my gigs, and I'm focusing on lining up with the bass player. You can then have them add a rim knock. I always start on four, because that's just, it's a good way to have that pocket on four. Uh, Duke Ellington's drummer, Sam Woodyard, he did that a lot. That's how he drove the, the Duke Ellington orchestra. Then you can do, you can do two and four. So would you say that feels swinging? Does that feel like swing? And it's not really too difficult. And if, if the drummer is very uncoordinated, don't even worry about the other limbs, just focus on that. And what I'm doing is a cycle. It's not like start and stop. It's a circle, whether it's an infinity sign, that's a lot of movement. 
but it's a circle. Daga do, daga do, daga do, daga do, daga do. And if you want to break it down, one trip left, two trip left, three trip left. If you're playing slow, you can do that, but by doing that, I am moving in time. The pulse isn't just what you hear. The pulse is the, the motion of the drummer. So as you're showing your students, here's quarter note, it's not just start and stop. It's this, it's really 12-8. Okay, so that's, that's level one. Start with one limb, add two, add three. Pretty good from there. So then level two, you've got some of the pieces. They're pretty good. Then you can add that subdivision. And then when they have that, then they can start comping with their left hand. So you could start with upbeats, the ands, on every, every beat of the measure. So you could start with the and of one. And of two. And of three. Etc. Then end of four. Then they can do two of them. sure that isn't to the detriment of, of the swing beat there. So left hand and then also foot. And then combinations of hand and foot. That's just to start start with coordination. It's really just the next level. Um, you could start doing um, patterns of eighth notes. Think about uh, melodies. Think about um, straight note chaser. but then there's also the musicality behind that. Get them to think about well, why and when are you doing those, those eighth notes on the beat, off the beat. Next level is when you start to get into more triplet comping, because if, if the ride symbol is based on triplets, you want to comp with triplets. <laughs> As you can see, it starts to get more complicated than just the upbeats and all that. Now keep in mind, tempos change, so the eighth note pulse changes. Slower tempos are going to be triplet based. Daga do, daga do, daga. When you get to a certain point, you're not going to go daga do, daga do, daga do. It starts to flatten out as eighth notes. So if someone's comping like this. Don't 
broken time. I'm, I'm, I'm very away from ding, ding, and ding. So I want to show you an exercise. There's a book called Ted Reed's Syncopation that's been around for a long time. And if you look at it, it's just a snare drum line of notes. But jazz drummers and teachers like Alan Dawson, who taught so many great drummers at Berkeley, have developed a system for jazz drummers. So here's an example. So he would say, take this, play all quarter notes and longer on bass drum and cymbal, all eighth notes on the snare drum. And so then you could start to have broken a musical time like this. One, two, here I go. four-bar solo there. One thing I would do is I would have my drummers play time and then just play the first measure like that. Then play time, then play the second measure. I'll demonstrate. So that's broken time, and this is a great way to practice, really, really great for the reading too. Because then if they see big band charts that have these kind of rhythms, suddenly they could play more musical than just... You know, there's a whole, there's a whole list of these exercises that they develop, and it's very, very cool for developing jazz vocabulary. It's just about in every music store because it's still very popular. And it's actually a good book for just sight reading, syncopated rhythms, just snare drum. But you can assign them roles around the kit. Um, and it breaks you off from linear to or whichever. You know, you start from straight on this to like that. So now they learned how to play swing. And so now it's like, well, now we have to apply that to big band. So go back in time to working with your beginning drummer, sixth grade band, first day, and they have a big band chart. Oh, they could barely play swing. Just have them simply play time. You know, don't let them, don't worry about, they'll get overwhelmed if they don't know how to read the charts. So they can just. It gets them to just practice playing in time, practice with the bass player. And just know, you probably feel this when you're in front of the band, being a drummer is very difficult because you're having to keep all these people on, on pulse. And when I was younger, I would just go with it. If they were dragging, I would drag. Um, and then when I started to realize, no, it's my responsibility to push. And that's very difficult when you have someone playing almost a different feel, a different tempo. So again, beginning drummer, just have them play time. Don't worry about the kicks, they will come later. If they're able to read rhythms, go ahead and read the drum part. Many drum parts are poorly written, but at least at least it's a start. Level two, when you're starting to interpret rhythms, be able to read rhythms. Kind of like what I demonstrated there with that syncopation. You want to think musically, think like a horn player. So in my um, 
my beginning lessons for big band, we think, okay, so horn players are playing short notes. Bop, bop. So many times I hear drummers do this. I see a short eighth note. They just played a long note. They just played a long note, as opposed to, you know, what's a short note? That could be a short note. And then, what's a long sound? Um, that alone can really tighten up a band, especially if you have do dot on the end of four, and then it's a measure of rest. And you know that has filled in that has filled in that gap. So play long notes long, short notes short. That's a very simple concept. And you can challenge your drummer, okay, play me a short sound. Or I have the horn player say, what's a short sound on the snare, or on the snare? What's a short sound? I'll say snare, this. Um, and then I also think of range. What's a high sound, a timbre, you know, like a trumpet. What might complement a trumpet? A snare drum, a clean shot, a stab as opposed to a berry sax or a trombone. If you think about it, it's like, ooh, that's cool. Bass drum, low sound. I have dark cymbals. That sounds really good with a trombone. That one's okay. So now, now I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking short and long, and I'm thinking high and low. And suddenly your brain has just expanded, and the drummer is thinking so much more musically rather than, oh, kick. Or, you know, it might be trumpet, trombone. You think about it, bop, bop, oh, oh. That is so much more hip and it's more relevant to what the band is playing. If you listen to Mel Lewis, Mel Lewis always read a trumpet part and he would, <clears throat> he would orchestrate his, his part around what the band was doing. He rarely just thought, oh, drum, drum lick, drum lick, drum lick. It was low sound, high sound, mushy, mushy, tight, that kind of a thing. So that's where you can start getting to the next level stuff for your drummers. So here's an example. Everyone see that okay? So here's the top line. Just the first two measures. So you look at what do you see. I see a short note and a long note. So... Maybe it was the bass or the very sax. Kind of a long sound on the first one, but I stabbed it there. Uh, so, so that's an example there. That's just hitting what they call hitting the kicks, like you're hitting what's written. Then there's the whole thing about setups. And there's a lot of different philosophies for that. But I want you to think about this. Try opposite sounds for setups in the kicks. So if the kick is a high sound, set it up with a low sound. Because that swings, as opposed to You hear that? For me, you know, I could think, well, there's a little bit more space if I do different limbs, as opposed to, it's kind of tight so that doesn't swing. Also think about it, what makes something swing? You have dynamics, you also have high-low sounds. But 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 I always thinking, oh, it's accent, unaccented, but 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 you could also think it's a high-low sound. But 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 That swings on a drum rather than... I mean, I can do dynamics. That's hard, but if I go... Uh, suddenly I'm flowing more, I'm swinging more, because I'm playing it more like a horn player would. So with setups, that's one of the rules. If you play a high sound on the, on the kick, set up with a low sound. 
And you can have one note like I was just doing, oftentimes, but not always, in the hole where that rest is. So that's one note. And then when you start to do two notes, it's basically... That was three, sorry. Um, but the rule I have for the two notes, I guess, and the one note is, the other thing is opposite hands. Do opposite hands. You want to avoid... As opposed to... It just flows better. You stab if you try to do the same thing. Um, and there's just, you can back and forth. Two hands is always going to sound tighter, meaning like doubles are always going to be tighter than alternating hands. That's just, that's just the thing. So then the third level, even though that right there, that can challenge even an advanced drummer if they're not yet thinking that way. You might have an advanced drummer that's really got the kicks down, but they might be doing the exact same setups and kicks every time. So if you just challenge them to think musically, those things that I was talking about, what instrument is playing that kick? What might be a complimentary sound for that? So then, that advanced level, that's what I'm saying there, make artistic decisions, take liberties um, with what's being played. So there's, I call it either bassy style or a contemporary style. And when I think of bassy style, it's playing time, playing time, and then there's a kick, and then you're playing time, playing time, and then there's a kick as opposed to contemporary, where the time is more interactive and the time incorporates those kicks. Uh, one of my teachers, Ed Self, used to say, play as if you want the audience to not know what's written and what you're just playing for your groove, so that the kicks are then seamless in it. So I'm going to first play it maybe Count Basie style, where I got time, and then I play the kick, and then time. One, two, here I go. Okay, so I was playing time, and then it was just by itself, there's these kicks. Now I'm going to try to play seamless and, and incorporate these kicks into my time. I'm going to play a little bit of time first. Here I go. contemporary style. I do not play that way if I'm playing a Count Basie thing. I just, I try to play true to the style. But, um, you know, young bands are playing a lot of contemporary stuff because new stuff is being written. And that is a more contemporary sound. Um, I often hear these advanced bands playing really neat stuff, but the students are kind of stuck in, in their thinking Basie style. Um, the other thing is knowing what to play and what to leave out. I rarely play everything that's written. If you have Baba Doo Dot, that's a lot of notes for the drummer. What I usually do, I play the first. Because what it does is it's punctuating the accents that the horns are playing. And again, it's really hard for drums to to swing. You can swing, and like you heard that when I was first playing, I was really laid back and all that. But again, those are the, the artistic, artistic decisions that the more advanced drummers can make. I do think it's important just when you're learning how to read to like be trying to play everything so that you can get that down. But that's really what I tell drummers in that next level. Okay, so shuffle. This is one of the biggest infractions I see um, on the bandstand. Shuffle is it's deceptively difficult. It really is difficult to maintain and play really well. And a lot of drummers like here do this. And that doesn't really have the right groove. So fundamental of what a shuffle is, a shuffle is basically, think about this, a swing feel with heavy quarter notes and a backbeat. And that's not even addressing the shuffle. Do -ka -da -ka -do -ka -da. So I can switch from swing to this. Swing, shuffle. 
Bossa Nova or Latin. This is the kind of thing where I, my students, they either get it or they don't. I have had sixth graders who can play just the Bossa Nova rhythm just fine, and I've had college students where I work an entire semester trying to get them. So be patient with your drummers, it is difficult. So, again, beginning jazz band, a lot of junior high jazz bands, parts are Bossa Novas, and that can be really difficult. So here's how you kind of cheat your way. Most drummers can play a rock beat, so if you get them to play this, most can handle that. If you simply take that back beat, put it on a rim knock, it works. You know, blue boss. Don't listen to my singing. Honestly, that works. That works. That's better than them trying and failing. If they can do this, they can do that. That's my go-to when, okay, they, they're really, really struggling with that. Then when they're ready, you can show them. And that is almost always written in their part, so when they're ready, um, they can do that. But for now, just have them play a rock beat like this. If they can't do that, that's going to be a little like a skeleton, but hopefully the bass is, is laying that down. So there's your whatever works kind of thing. So now you have a drummer that can do this. What's the next step? So that's where you can have them go to the right symbol. Seems like a simple move, but you've gone from three limbs to four limbs, which can be very overwhelming. Because now you have the high note. Again, it's, it's harder than it looks. Going from here to there is, is a pretty good move. But they're usually ready to do that. So you have, you have that. Then they can start improvising in the ring knock pattern. If you listen to the Jamie Abersall play-alongs, um, the drummers usually do that, and it's a good, good place for them to listen to variations on bosses. So then the next level would be um, changing up the right symbol, breaking away from the eighth notes, going from that to right away that breathes more. It goes from this to, to this kind of thing. As opposed to... Both are legitimate, but if you notice, it's very... It gives it a, a different pulse. And then it can allow the drummer... But that's level three. The other primer I have my drummers go through is... When they have this down, is to practice all quarter notes on the beat. Maybe move it around the kick. Then what's more difficult, all upbeats. Because if they can do those two, they can start to do fills. start doing it there. So then level three is the broken time, starting to improvise, breaking this up. Right there, because then if you're having lots of solos, lots of solos, um, gives them more to do and they can interact with the soloist. So again, you can take that Ted Reed syncopation page Eighth notes are just regular hits, and longer notes are shoulder crashes. Let's do the second line. and buzzes, but you see 
how that suddenly my vocabulary can just really expand and explode. Be so much more interesting for the drummer. And I really got this idea for this clinic, and particularly Bassa, when I was working with Newport's band. And the director, we were just rehearsing in the room, they were playing a Bassa. And he just said, my drummer gets stuck. Because the drummer can play, play a Bassa just fine, but they were just trapped because it's like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to fill, whatever, I'm getting bored. And so it really made me think, well, what I would tell him was this. And I thought, well, why don't I make a hand up? So that's really where this came from. In doing this, it gives them a vocabulary to start again. The goal is always to make musical drummers. Moving on. So this is a good transition to samba. When you start playing this, that's actually the same thing you could do for a samba. So here's bossa. Bossa is four bass, chukka, chukka, chukka. Samba is two, boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom. Same thing. Same thing I did as a boss. I just switched from uh, an emphasis on four to an emphasis on two. So that's where that broken time is, can be very, very versatile. Remember the difference between a bossa and a samba 
One is in four. Chicka chicka. The other one is don donk 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 donk. And I'm showing you, I'm playing the same rhythm. I'm just changing, just changing the emphasis there. So I'll try to do this really quick. And this is a video I have on my on my um, YouTube channel, and it's, it's what I call the Jeff Hamilton Samba. And this is what he teaches. And if you listen, really open my ears to a lot of the pros. Oh, this is how they play a samba when they break away from this. So think about this. This is perfect for your drummers who really got a lot going on. Now it's like, okay, what else can I do? So here are the rules. Unison hands, alternating every other measure. One measure is on the beat, the other measure is off the beat. So you do this. Of course, horn players are tracking too. But you see how a 
horn player shows them exactly what to play. Except for the solo section, it's like, here's the changes, you decide. It's kind of like what the drummer is tasked with the entire time. And so I have to make decisions. I think, okay, I'm gonna leave this out. You'll notice, I don't know if you were able to notice, hitting a lot of the, if you have multiple notes, you hit the last one. When they were going ba ba doo ba da ba doo ba, I was going ba ba doo ba da ba doo ba da ba doo da ba da because I want to make sure the horns are tracking right there. And if I went da ba doo da ba doo da ba doo da, it might work, but it would be very heavy though. That is actually all the time we have. Thank you very much. I hope you got something out of this.